learn how to do symptometry. Um, so your lecture for um, how to do symptometry will be by Professor Siddharth Shubhani from um, also from IIA. Um, uh, Professor Barbie did his uh, PhD at Rajput University and then went to Ayuta, worked with Professor Nikhil Kavi and then spent a decade in South Africa working at SAO. And uh, during the gravitational wave events of uh, August 17, 2017, a lot of the beautiful infrared data that you see uh, was data collected by, by him. So, um, so you could hear straight from the horse's mouth how to actually do photometry and uh, that gets published in 10 papers all in the <laughs> I don't <laughs> Lost the count. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this talk is about uh, how to basically do the photometry. Uh, since uh, from your previous uh, tutorial, you have reduced image with you. So now you have an image and uh, uh, well briefly, well without going into a much detail, uh, I will tell you uh, what photometry is and what are some of the, the requirements that you should know before you actually do the photometry uh, and then uh, and then afterwards hopefully you will able to uh, do the, the next tutorial. Okay. So what photometry is, it is basically a direct measure of integrated flux that is counts per second per time per unit area received from a celestial object. So once you have an image, you have to measure counts or uh, integrated flux from the object of your interest and uh, and then in this session, we are going to learn the techniques and tools how we can measure uh, the fluxes or integrated flux from uh, your object of interest, okay. So the thing uh, that uh, we are going to see in this session. Uh, how do you measure the flux from an object? Uh, an object before actually doing so, uh, some terminology that uh, you may need to know, uh, and then uh, what are the challenges that you might face apart from the software tools techniques? And uh, obviously, does it matter what type of uh, object you are studying? Uh, that is, if your photometry or techniques that you are using uh, that uh, depends. Uh, on the type of object you are studying. So it is probably the most fundamental measurement that uh, we can make uh, in observational astronomy uh, that is how actually we measure the light that uh, we are receiving from an object which means that how bright or faint that object is. So that is what uh, uh, basically uh, uh, one thing we want to do in observational astronomy and in photometry. So, so just a briefly uh, what the, the light is. In astronomy, we generally deal uh, with the amount of light emitted in terms of uh, either a luminosity or intensity or if you are measuring, a, if you are having extended object uh, that is in terms of surface brightness or in flux. So flux typically you define as a, a energy per unit area per unit time and uh, this will be uh, a generally a function of wavelength. So a lot of uh, the time you will see either F nu or F lambda uh, when you uh, basically uh, measure the flux. So uh, for historical reasons, uh, in UV optical and IR astronomy, we measure the fluxes or we represent the fluxes in terms of magnitudes. And the magnitudes we define using this equation minus 2.5 log of 10 f plus a constant uh, which many times we see a, a zero point. So, so let us first uh, uh, see what, what this magnitude is and uh, this slide basically gives uh, a basic uh, information about uh, a magnitude or a stellar magnitude scale. So the stellar magnitude scale is basically uh, based on the range of star brightness that your eye can perceive. Uh, which was invented around uh, 120 BC by Hipparchus. So he devised the six step brightness between the brightest and the faintest star seen by eye, where the smaller magnitude implies a brighter star. So if you are talking about a magnitude 
one of a star which means you are seeing a brighter star compared to uh, a star which has a magnitude 5 or 10. So, this uh, definition uh, got modified and uh, what are the steps uh, that we have taken to modify this definition is that uh, early photometric measurements uh, that demonstrated that the first magnitude stars are about 100 times brighter than the six magnitude stars. So, in 1856, uh, normal, uh, Norman Poxon of uh, Oxford proposed that uh, there should be a, a logarithmic scale of, uh, of this number, uh, 100 uh, the root of 5, which approximately gives you uh, a 2.5 uh, to be adopted between the magnitudes, okay. So, that the 5 magnitude steps correspond precisely to the factor of 100 in brightness. Okay. So, for example, if you have a first magnitude star that will be 2 point times brighter than the second magnitude star and uh, 2.5 square times brighter than the third magnitude star and so on and so forth. Okay. So, that is how uh, you get uh, this, uh, this equation where uh, you can actually get the, the magnitude which is minus 2.5 log 10 of the plus. Now, so what we have, uh, so so this is this is a plot uh, between the uh, the wavelength and the flux that we receive at any particular wavelength, and uh, if we just measure the total flux under this curve, uh, then our magnitude, what we call, is a a bolometric magnitude. Okay, but uh, instead of doing this, normally what we do is we consider a finite band or what we call uh, filters and uh, we measure uh, the fluxes in these finite band passes. So, for example, in this uh, in this cartoon, uh, we are measuring uh, the, the flux in certain range of the wavelength or we are actually integrating the flux over this uh, range of wavelength and let us say for example, now we consider that uh, that range is uh, around uh, uh, 550 nanometers, okay. So, in astronomy that we defined as a visual band, okay. So, which basically uh, uh, gives us uh, 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 a lot of information that what we are doing, we are dividing whatever the total flux we receive uh, into a different wavelength bands, okay. So, so that actually gives us uh, as an idea that uh, what sort of uh, the fluxes we receive at uh, a different uh, wavelengths broadly speaking and what are uh, a broad characteristics of these object based on uh, the differences between uh, the fluxes that we receive in these two bands. okay. So, I will just give some more uh, information about uh, these uh, band passes. So, what we call this, uh, this filters or band pass is the astronomical photometric system, which means that they are a set of well defined uh, filters with a known sensit sensitivity to the in uh, incident photons, okay. So, in, in this uh, figure, what I have shown is uh, basically a set of five Sloan filters. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about uh, uh, measuring uh, or using the filters in GIR. Uh, bands. So, these are basically uh, those filters. So, what it does basically, so it basically allows uh, only uh, uh, those photons which are sensitive to these filters to pass through it. And then you are measuring uh, the photon in that certain uh, band pass. So, for example, yesterday uh, we were measuring the, the fluxes of photons in G band pass which is uh, I guess somewhere here. Okay. So, it basically uh, uh, this, this curve that I have shown here is a transmission curve which basically uh, a wavelength versus uh, uh, the, the, the transformation function for the filter and it basically tells you that over a what wavelength range uh, your filter works uh, with, uh, with, which actually gives you uh, a, a, a central wavelength for, for that band pass. Okay. So, typically these uh, filters or band passes we divide uh, into uh, uh, three types. 
broadband, intermediate band, and the narrow band. So broadband, basically, they have a large uh, uh, wavelength range. Uh, sometimes it is uh, actually more than, uh, most of them, they are actually around uh, uh, more than 30 nanometers. Uh, and most famous in old days was a Johnson Morgan UBB system. Okay. And nowadays, it has been replaced by, obviously, the Sloan filters. Uh, then the intermediate band, uh, where uh, the wavelength uh, 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 range has been reduced, and the narrow band are basically specially designed to uh, do some specific types of observation, and their uh, wavelength region uh, or wavelength range is very small, around 10 nanometers. So this is just an, an uh, sort of a photometric system available all over the, the observatories that uh, we use. And as I said, uh, uh, normally nowadays we use uh, a Sloan standard filters uh, when we do the, the optical astronomy. Okay. So, so now uh, we know that uh, how uh, we can basically uh, uh, convert our fluxes into magnitudes and in which uh, specific uh, band we are uh, we are measuring our magnitudes. So, <coughs> we just uh, uh, try to see what that constant is, which basically uh, we call in many of our uh, uh, conversations or as you will see in the tutorial uh, notebook, uh, zero point. Okay. So what zero point is? So this zero point is basically specific to uh, a telescope detector and a filter system. And how basically you determine this? So either you do it by yourself or your telescope system. Uh, in uh, in this case, growth, or what we can do uh, is that uh, once we have an instrumental magnitude, that is the first part of of the the this equation, and uh, we actually then compare this uh, magnitudes to the standard magnitudes from the catalog and determine the scaling factor, and that is what I guess we will do in in the tutorial. Okay, so so that will basically give us an idea that how far. Uh, our, how far away our system is from the standard system. Uh, this slide just basically gives you an old way to measure this zero point. Uh, so what basically we do is that observationally, we basically observe many standard stars, uh, which we already know what their standard magnitudes are uh, and colors are, and they should be all over the sky, not all over the place. and. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, they, they should uh, they should relatively uh, close together in the sky, but uh, they should have uh, all color and wide range of magnitudes, uh, and uh, they should be observed very quickly because what uh, we do is that uh, when you want to determine this constant or a zero point precisely, you should worry about the sky condition, and your sky condition should not uh, change uh, uh, over uh, observing time. So. Uh, generally, what we look for is a photometric night, which means that uh, a clear night when the atmospheric transparency is almost constant. And at that time, uh, we would observe these uh, stars quickly. And we basically then have uh, these kind of transformation relations uh, where we compare the instrumental magnitude and uh, uh, our uh, uh, standard magnitudes. and. Uh, we basically uh, get the uh, the sort of a zero point. So zero point in this equation is is this for a various pass bands. Okay. So so that is that is how we basically determine the zero point. And nowadays, since uh, as you can see from the the relative procedure, uh, it is very expensive or time consuming to wait and observe for these uh, standards. So we normally compare it uh, with already, uh, uh, well, uh, well, sort of a catalogs uh, which have done this already, and then we try to find the offsets uh, between uh, our magnitudes and the uh, the catalog magnitude, and that we use as a zero point. Okay. So now having all these uh, techniques and tools with us, uh, the thing that we have to do is to measure the fluxes. Okay. And how we do that? So we actually use uh, uh, this technique called the aperture photometry, which is wide, uh, widely used in the stellar photometry. Uh, uh, most of the time when we actually uh, 
measure the fluxes from the stellar photometry, we use uh, uh, this technique. Uh, this has a two component where uh, we do a simple aperture photometry or we uh, do a PSF photometry. And then for extended object, we call it a surface photometry. And obviously, uh, this is not the, the part of today's uh, uh, topic. So how we do this aperture photometry? So simply what we do, we have an object which is a star and we actually uh, put a, a lot of apertures and we actually measure the fluxes within this predefined typically circular apertures. Okay, so uh, so this is a, a sort of a, uh, fluxes we want to measure. So you measure the fluxes for example in this uh, or, or this uh, uh, annulus and whatever the fluxes you will have, you will sum it over all the fluxes and this will contain the flux from the, uh, the object plus the flux from the background sky. Okay. Uh, but uh, what you need to do is that you need to remove the contribution from, from background. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so you need to measure uh, uh, the flux for uh, to estimate this uh, sky in another adjacent uh, local annulus and then you subtract it uh, from, uh, from this uh, object plus sky and then you will have a, a flux from uh, object itself. Okay. So, uh, so that is that is way uh, uh, in, in sort of very naive way uh, your aperture photometry works. Uh, of course, uh, it is not as simple as when you go to the, the actual measurement. Uh, so, the idea is that you measure the flux in one uh, annulus uh, or one aperture and then subtract whatever the, the sky that is around your object from, from whatever the flux measurement you have done and you have the, the fluxes, integrated fluxes with the, for that object and you get the, the magnitude and then you proceed further. Okay. Uh, so, so wh what I mean by proceed further is that then you calibrate uh, your uh, fluxes using the equation I showed in the previous slide and then uh, so, so this flux that you measure is actually a, a function of a aperture. So you need to mention that at what aperture you are measuring this flux. But then you can measure the total fluxes as long as uh, you uh, know how to measure the total fluxes. And for that you basically uh, uh, plot the curve of growth. So this is this is what I mean by curve of growth. So what does we do here is that we actually uh, measure the magnitude in concentratic uh, apertures and at some point you will see that uh, the the magnitude almost has settled uh, in uh, or the fluxes have settled in at the aperture and we take that as our uh, uh, aperture where uh, the uh, the light within this this aperture is uh, is uh, is you think that you have have the most of the light from that source uh, and then obviously there is a outer uh, uh, annulus where you can measure the sky and that basically uh, will uh, give you the total fluxes from that object and that that you can take as a, as a total uh, magnitude for a particular target. So, so this is this is what uh, uh, we call the curve of growth where you just plot uh, the intensity versus aperture radius uh, that you have measured in the various apertures. So what are the, the, the advantage? Basically uh, you are measuring uh, the fluxes in a predefined aperture. Uh, you can actually calibrate uh, uh, your magnitude as long as uh, you use the same aperture uh, for your standard star and uh, you can compute the total fluxes if you able to plot this curve of growth. And what are the disadvantages? So uh, here we actually simply assume that, uh, uh, that our background is, uh, is linearly varying uh, in the aperture's vicinity which might not be the, the case. Uh, and then uh, the biggest disadvantage is the aperture size. So bigger aperture means more fluxes from the target but also the more noise from the sky uh, and the varying uh, background uh, which might add a more noise into your uh, flux measurement and also uh, it does not work uh, uh, when your uh, field is crowded. Crowded means there are a lot of stars and overlapping sources. Uh, uh, where uh, measuring the sky would be an issue, uh, even the fluxes would be an issue. Okay, so this is a relatively uh, easy, fast uh, uh, way 
uh, where you are measuring uh, the fluxes from uh, isolated sources. But what happens when you actually go to a, this kind of image where there are a lot of objects in your frame and you want to measure the fluxes uh, in, in this crowded field. Okay. So, so what we do here is that basically we use a technique called a, a PSF photometry. Okay. So now uh, as we have discussed uh, several times and we have used these terms uh, over this, okay. so, so that actually depends on, uh, on your target. Okay. Uh, so, so what, what sort of uh, uh, the image you are seeing at uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, the star is on your image. Okay. So if your star PSF is bigger. Uh, you have a, a you sh you have to take a bigger PSA, a bigger uh, aperture. If it is uh, small, you should take a small aperture. So so that is one of the the, the disadvantage of uh, the aperture photometry, where uh, you uh, need to basically uh, spend some time to decide which aperture you should take. Okay, so that's why the curve of growth is helpful, where you plot uh, uh, these uh, fluxes at various. Uh, uh, apertures and then decide okay at this point you think that your uh, uh, star contains all the fluxes and that aperture you can take okay sorry aperture uh, no so it is uh, object specific okay so it's not about the image so for example if your image contains few isolated stars and it depends on how your star whether it's bright or faint Okay, so 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 that is where you need to uh, basically uh, decide. It is uh, uh, how and uh, which aperture you can use. So that is another disadvantage. Okay, so that's why we actually most of the time uh, end up using a PSF photometry. Okay. okay, so 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 you basically know what what uh, uh, why we actually talk about the the PSF. Okay, so. You know that at, at a telescope uh, focal plane, uh, uh, your point source, like a stars, they are not exactly a point source. So they appear as a as a circular disk. Okay, and that is uh, that is uh, what uh, uh, that is what we call uh, a PSF, and we use obviously some mathematical functions to define this two-dimensional distribution uh, of of this this. Uh, spread of light and that is what we call the point spread function. So typically when you uh, do some sort of image examination, uh, you can plot uh, this kind of a surface plot uh, where the x uh, and y is your the plane uh, and then, then the z axis you can see the, the intensity and as you can see that uh, this uh, spread, uh, it's, you can well, uh, well uh, represent this by a, a very uh, very uh, easily by a uh, two uh, dimension uh, Gaussian function. Okay, uh, so so this is this is for uh, 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 the typical PSF that looked like for a for a star, uh, and uh, generally in astronomy we use uh, uh, these two functions uh, to parameterize uh, the PSF. Uh, so uh, in most of the cases we use Gaussian, uh, which uh, the parameters you can define uh, using these formulations or in many uh, cases uh, we also use the Moffat function and these are the typical uh, uh, way that uh, you can represent uh, these functions. Oh, okay, sorry, I will <laughs> change this. So this probably I've used the same images. Uh, so these are the image, uh, cannot do the let again. So yeah, uh, sorry about this, yeah. So uh, we'll show at some point what the Moffat function is. Okay, so what basically we do? Uh, in this PSF photometry. So we basically create a model for a point spread function of a stars, okay. Uh, and then uh, to do, uh, to get a, a good model, we use a large number of stars uh, in this frame. And then we iteratively subtract uh, the model from, from uh, the data that we have in form of stars. And then uh, we actually, again, redefine the models to minimize the residuals. So, so, uh, so what happens is that when you, when you do it iteratively, you will have for each uh, of your object uh, uh, a PSF, uh, and that you can define in terms of sigma and some radius, and then then you can use that uh, radius to get uh, 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 to define as aperture and get uh, the flux in that 
uh, aperture. Okay. So this is this works very well in in uh, crowded fields, and it also uses a sort of a weighting scheme where uh, the regions with the highest signal to noise ratio uh, have uh, get the most weight, uh, and then uh, you can also uh, include the background. Uh, uh, in this this fit, so that you don't need to worry about the the background. But there are some potential issues with that. Uh, 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 when uh, your PSF is not uh, uh, well defined, then obviously uh, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, uh, when we typically talk about the large field, your PSF can vary across the detector. So you need to also take care of that. That how basically you are going to use the the PSF photometry. And I will just uh, end this uh, uh, with uh, uh, one thing which we normally call the aperture correction. Okay. So what the aperture correction is, it is basically a uh, scaling factor to match the magnitudes of a target and the standard stars. Okay. So what happens is that uh, uh, sometimes uh, you do not know uh, what apertures have been used to measure the magnitudes of your standard stars. But you definitely know uh, that uh, what uh, sort of uh, apertures you are using in in your uh, image for your stars. So basically, then you need to uh, actually uh, use uh, uh, a technique uh, which we call aperture photo, uh, aperture corrections to match uh, uh, these magnitudes and find out the scaling factor uh, so that you can apply that scaling factor to the magnitude in addition to a zero points. But uh, if you have a, a sort of a uh, you measure the the uh, you know that your standard stars and the target stars they have used the same apertures uh, to measure the the fluxes and hence magnitude so you don't need to basically uh, do this and you can apply uh, uh, the same magnitude uh, which we basically use as a zero point uh, for, uh, for for getting your uh, your uh, targets magnitude and then you do not need to apply the aperture correction. Okay. So you will get to know about all these uh, terms uh, when you actually follow various steps of the, the tutorials that uh, we will do the next. So we will stop here. Well, uh, what happens normally is that uh, that, that is uh, why you use a, a large number of stars. Okay, so so to so actually get to know that threshold. Okay, so what uh, you should get is that uh, a, a sort of a PSF model, which exactly represents the whatever sort of a sources are there in your images. Okay, so idea is uh, that uh, to use a large number of stars to get to know which uh, a model exactly works uh, uh, best for both brighter and dark fainter sources. Of course, when your uh, uh, star is either much brighter or much fainter. So that thing will fail, okay. But it will. It generally works well uh, uh, for for a well uh, defined uh, well where, where you can able to avoid all these uh, extreme points. Basically, yeah. I guess uh, that I exactly don't know. I haven't worked on the the uh, very extensively on the global clusters. Actually, so obviously uh, again I said that. Uh, uh, you need to basically worry about uh, uh, what sort of a PSF you have for your um, uh, in the field of uh, where the globular cluster is, okay. And then then you need to uh, compute the model according to that, okay. So if your standard star which is far away is much brighter, obviously you cannot use that. Okay. So giving uh, some number is obviously uh, uh, a bit difficult. You have to work out when you see the image which you will do in the tutorial. Do we use photometry to measure a redshift? It is possible in some very special cases. Yes. <laughs> it's, it is possible in some very special cases for really high redshift analysis. Yes, there is a technique known as the Lyman break. Uh, but the idea is that if you have very strong absorption shortwards of some wavelength, you would see the, the photometric flux cut off. And that gives you some handle on the redshift, but it's still no, it's, it's not as good as a spectroscopic redshift. So it's, it's basically a not a, a good way to measure a redshift, or no way to measure a redshift. <laughs> okay. Can talk.
right so as you already heard in the lecture there are two ways of doing photometry one is aperture photometry the other is PSF photometry we will be only doing point sources today uh, galaxies and extended sources are a totally different lecture in itself um, so right so if uh, okay how many of you have the notebook up and open okay that looks reasonable okay perfect okay right so we can start walking through the steps so as before just import a few modules that we need um, okay and I wanted to start with just just one single reduced image that we created in the last module so if you just run this cell you should see an image come up oh you don't uh, just add it I mean I don't think it makes a difference but add it here and I think for this notebook the if you are using the docker no it's it's fixed on the detector coordinates it's not on the sky so yes yes or you shift the detector a bit with respect to the sky then and if you stack them then because the bat column is falling on different locations in the sky everything gets lost that's the way you would want to do this okay 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 perfect so this is a reduced image from the previous module and we'll be doing photometry on this image okay so the general procedure in photometry is to is to query an external catalog so the idea is that you know today there are sky surveys that have actually derived magnitudes for most of the sky and uh, the idea is that you query an external catalog you ask the question these are the stars inside my field and what are the magnitudes of the stars that are there inside the field you want to compare those external catalog magnitudes to the magnitudes that you actually measure from the image and that's that's basically what we will do here so the first step in that is act to, is actually to query an external catalog in this case for this field we'll be querying what is uh, um, a catalog from the panstar survey so the panstar panstar is a is an all sky is it, is it all sky mansi is panstar all sky yeah it's, yeah it's, yeah so it's almost all sky yeah uh, uh, it's an all sky survey that has uh, well calibrated magnitudes for stars in most part of the sky and what we'll do here is first um, so the image that we have here already has the astrometry derived on it and the astrometry and to in order to um, download an external catalog you have to tell panstars that I want stars that are within some radius of my field and that's why we will first read in what is the uh, location of the image so this is what WCS does. so WCS stands for world coordinate system it's a term that you will come across very frequently in image reduction it, it, WCS is effectively uh, tells you uh, what is the location of the image in the sky so uh, if you just go ahead and run that um, what we're doing here is that we are we are reading the center coordinates of the image so this we are reading the WCS of the image reading what is the cent the center coordinate of the image and we are setting the size of the radius so we are querying all stars that are within 30 arc minutes of the center of the image and then we are also setting what is the maximum magnitude which so recall that magnitudes so the larger the magnitude the fainter the source so what we are doing here is that we are we are asking to return stars which are brighter than 18th magnitude because that's about the typical sensitivity you get in a short exposure so let's see okay so the next step is to use the astropies interface for querying it's called astro query and um, this is where we will be querying the vizier catalog so the vizier is again uh, you can look up google vizier it's uh, it's just a database of lots of different surveys um, it has catalog magnitudes for ob all different kinds of objects that are recorded by surveys so if you just run this shell can take a bit of time because it's actually downloading a fair bit of data so what you're doing here is that we are querying pan stars around a right ascension of this declination of this with a radius of so sorry right ascension declination and radius of 30 arc minutes this is a v641 signal which i think is a cepheid vari variable yeah so this is the source that you will be working on in the light curve module uh, it's it's, a, it's it's just a field that has an interesting variable star in it okay 
So if that query worked, you should see a list of stars being displayed. You'll have the array of the stars, you'll have the deck of the stars, and all sorts of magnitudes that are returned. Okay, perfect. Yes, okay. Um, right. So I had I just had this in case the internet did not work, but it looks like it worked. So you don't need to don't don't run this cell. Do not run this cell. Uh, because you'll get an error and that might scare you. So yes, yes, yes. It will. <laughs> yeah. um, right. What do I have? Yes. So um, let's see. The the next step is to so. This, what this catalog returned is a list of stars within 30 arc minutes of the center of the image. Um, for photometric calibrations, you only want to select stars that are within some region of the center of the image. Where the idea is that you don't want to select stars that are in the vignetted region because the sensitivity is really weird over there. So uh, this is an exercise for you. So what, you, what, what the query returned is an astropy table. And you can uh, filter on the astropy table to select stars that are only within um, within pixel coordinates of about 500 to 3500 within, that is about the center of the image so you can give it a try uh, I'll, I'll wait for a moment but yeah I'll show you the solution eventually so the idea is to you have the coordinates of the stars that were returned from the catalog and then you want to se only select stars that are within the center uh, some central box of the image because we only want to do photometric calibration with those stars. So give it a shot. Uh, yeah, we'll continue after a moment. So what you want to do here is get the pixel coordinates for all of the stars that are, were detected in the, that were returned by the catalog. You have to get the pixel coordinates for those stars, and then create a list of stars that are inside the central whatever three thousand pixels of the image. Okay. Anybody still having issues with getting the external catalog working? Did every did everybody get the external catalog printout? Anybody with an, still an issue getting the external catalog? Okay. So let's see what we're doing here. So if you just pay attention to this. So what we're doing here is that so Q is a, an astropy table with the coordinates of the objects, the array and deck for the objects that are within the 30 arc minute radius, and I'm using this function astropy function to so it says world to pix. World to pix means give trans, convert the array and deck coordinates of the stars in the image to pixel coordinates based on the WCS of the image that I already know. So W is the WCS of the image that we already know. I'm asking Astropy to give me the pixel coordinates for these stars. And then once we have the pixel coordinates, what I'm doing is I'm creating a an array called good catalog stars or good cat stars where I'm requiring that the the x coordinate is is the x coordinate of the star is greater than 500 x coordinate is also less than 3500 the y coordinate is also greater than 500 and the y coordinate is also less than 3500 so I'm only selecting stars that have pixel coordinates within some central region of the image any questions about that Oh yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. The the world to pix function. Yes. So the what world to pix does is that if you give it a list of RA and deck coordinates for the stars in the that you expect to see in the image, and you say world to pix, what it does is that it converts those world coordinates to pixel coordinates in the image. And the way it does that is because I know the position of the image in the sky. So if you give me any given array and deck, I should be able to tell you what is the pixel coordinate of the image. Yes. Crop the, okay. Uh, you might have an interesting source at the edge of the field. So <laughs> might have, so. I mean, uh, I mean it's, I, I, there's no reason to crop the image really. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, cropping the image would all, always mean losing information. I, I don't think, I mean, it's just for the photometric calibrations that I'm selecting stars within the central region of the image. Just for the photometric calibration, yes. Okay, so uh, just in case you want to look at this again. So once you set this up, just create this variable, good underscore cat underscore stars, where you require the, co the x coordinate. So 0 is x coordinate. The x coordinate should be between 500 and 3500. And the y coordinate, which is in the, in the first axis, you should be again between 500 and 3500. And just try to print it out. See if you can print it out. Okay. If you, if you're still having issues running this step, raise your hand. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just a continuation of this. So what you're doing here is, Sorry, what? Oh, okay, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I hope this is visible. Oops. Uh, yes. I think I can move on. Uh, Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move on uh, to the next step. So by now you should have the list of x and y coordinates for pan star sources that were detected, sorry, that are inside the field. And what, what just to make sure that you didn't get anything crazy, you can overlay the locations of those sources inside the image. So that's what the next th step does. So what I'm doing here is I am um, uh, getting the x and y positions of the source pan star sources inside the field, and I'm overlaying red circles on top of those uh, positions, just to see that what we are getting is no, these are actual sources inside the field that are detected in the image. So you can play around with this, but you see this is the the Growth India image, and you see there are there are red dots on the at the locations of the images. Uh, sorry, of, of the stars. Um, and you can play around with this. You can zoom into the center of the image to make sure that what you're actually seeing is those are actually stars. I know it's a bit difficult on this scale, but uh, you should in general see this pattern, which is red circles on the top of those pan stars, uh, uh, of the, on top of the detected sources. Yes. So, um, so what Varun just pointed out is that um, that Python has a slightly different convention for the axis when you open load a fits image and try to plot it. Um, I, in the sense that you will see different results if you open up an image in DS9 as opposed to pointing, uh, sorry, plotting it in uh, Python, um, where uh, it's because of the choice of the origin. So the, the in in Python, the origin is always this point here. So and if you plot it in x y coordinates, this is increasing x, increasing y. The DS DS9 is of opposite. <laughs> yes, you can always do, but yes, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, just something you should know. I mean, it's it's it, it is a common confusion. Okay. How many people were able to display this? Raise your hand. Okay. That's okay. That's good. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, now is now we actually start the serious business, which is actually doing aperture photometry, and so so far we have a catalog of sources that we expect to see inside the field. The next step is to actually detect the sources that are seen in the image. And to do this, we'll be using this uh, very uh, powerful code known as source extractor, where, so actually we did use source extractor even last time when we were doing uh, the astrometric calibration, but I didn't go into the details there. But the idea is that source extractor is uh, actually, it's actually a very powerful software that um, allows you to detect sources inside the field, measure their measure the amount of flux that you have inside uh, those sources uh, to actually do things like photometric calibration. So um, what you want to do next is to run source extractor on this image. So what I'm doing here is uh, just a configuration file. So the configuration file is important for source extractor. It actually controls the way source extractor runs. But in this case, I've actually already given you what source extractor should do. So what you should do is just go ahead and run this. And 
you can check the terminal. So you see this is source extractor running. So it detected about 4000 sources in the field and while detecting those sources it actually already performed all of the photometry that we need on those sources. Um, and that's what we will read eventually to uh, do the photometry on the sources that we want. Okay. Did this step run? Run? There's, sorry, what? Yes, it, oh, okay, so this, yes, the, no, the configuration file. The configuration file should be in the same folder uh, as, as was there in the Docker. Okay, how many people are having so, uh, issues running this step? Source extractor, okay. Okay, it's running, yes. Ah, uh, LDSC is, I actually don't know the full form of LDSC. It's just, um, it's a format that Source Extractor uses to store the catalog of sources uh, that, it's actually a format that most astromatic software use. Um, it's effectively a, a table that, we'll actually read the table eventually when we, Okay, so I, okay, how many were able to run source extractor? Raise your hands. Okay, I uh, think we should move on because, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so the next cell is actually just a function. It's, it's actually, it's, it's just a function to read a fit. So the output from source extractor is in the format known as, it's, it's a fits format. And what I've done here is just made, made a wrapper to read uh, the fits format and read it into an astropy table. So if you just, just, just run that cell, there's nothing else. Just run that cell. It will define this function. And after that, you want to, what I'm doing here is I'm reading the output from source extractor using this function and printing out the output. So if you were able to run this step, what you should see is all of the parameters that were measured by source extractor when it ran and as well as you know, just a, a list of parameters for the really random sources in the field. Just make sure you see something like this. Okay, so how many were able to get print this table? Okay, so um, what do I have next? So just just so you know, just note you know the kind of columns you have. You have the x position of the x position of the source. There is a column that has sorry the the column names are displayed. So there is there is the x and y position of the source. There is uh, the flux in the source there is there are actually even aperture based magnitudes in the in the, in this table so if you look at these columns mag underscore upper mag error underscore upper these are all aperture magnitudes that were already measured while source extractor ran so we in principle we also actually already have the data that we need to do the photometric calibration so if you go further down uh, so what I'm doing here again is selecting a set of clean sources to do the photometric calibration on. And 
one of the columns that Sourcer Charter does produce is this column called flags, where flags for good sources should be zero. If, for example, either the source is saturated or it falls on a bad column or something,
So what we have so far is a list of detected sources in the image and a list of known sources from panstars that should be in the image. So we now need to figure out which source in the, so you now need to figure out a cross match between every given source in the detected, in the detected image to every source in the panstars image, in the panstars catalog. And that's what we'll do in this uh, step of catalog cross matching where we are, what we are effectively doing is that we are taking two catalogs, one is the panstars catalog, one is the source charter catalog and asking AstroPy to cross match them, cross match all stars that are in this case within about 0.6 arc seconds. And 0.6 because that's about the pixel size of growth India. We are cross matching all sources that are within about um, 0.6 arc seconds of each other. So if you go ahead and run that, it should tell you that it found so how many cross matches. In this case, it found about 750 sources that were cross matched to each other inside the field. Uh, the, no, I mean, it typically should be smaller than a pixel, yes. Uh, but I just chose one pixel in this case. So um, now the, the actual part of photometry, which is deriving a zero point from the image. So as you heard in the lecture already, the, the apparent magnitude of a source as measured should, should, is related to the instrumental magnitude of the source by the zero point. And the instrumental magnitude is just minus two and a half log of the total flux. And because you're measuring a total flux, the flux depends on the size of the aperture that you use, which is exactly where this idea of aperture correction comes in. Where, so the idea is that in order to get consistent magnitude measurements, you should measure the magnitude of your calibration star in the same aperture as that of your science target. And uh, in this case, uh, let's see. Yes, and because the larger the size of the aperture, uh, the more flux you are collecting, the magnitudes will become systematically smaller for larger and larger apertures because, because of this minus sign. So the larger the aperture, the larger the total amount of flux, the smaller is the magnitude. So if you look at your magnitudes as a function of the size of the aperture, you should see a constant trend, which is you'll get brighter and brighter sources for, well, those are not expected, those brighter and brighter measurements for larger and larger apertures. So this is what I'm doing here, which is I'm plotting what is effectively what uh, Sudanshu mentioned as the curve of growth, where the idea is that the bigger the aperture, the more the flux, the smaller the magnitude. So if you are able to run this, you should see something that looks like this. So um, on the x-axis is the diameter of the aperture, and on the y-axis is the, the, the magnitude measured with respect to the largest aperture. So you see, it becomes brighter and brighter for larger apertures, and this is what we saw earlier as the curve of growth. And this is from actual data. Yes. Which formula? Not yet, no. No, these are instrumental magnitudes. Yes, these are, the magnitudes in this case are still measured with respect to the raw counts in the image. But we will do that as soon as we derive a zero point. So uh, let's see. Okay. So now, so this step is really the deciding step to see if you actually got a good cross match, a good calibration. Because what we'll do here is that we will plot the instrumental magnitude of the, of the sources detected in the image against the known pan stars magnitudes. And if your instrument is fine, if Growth India is fine, then we should see a good correlation between them. Fine. <laughs> uh, okay. So, what do you guys have to say about that? Looks good? <laughs> so, uh, about your question about variable stars, so you see those outliers, those are variable stars. So again, this is a plot of, on the y-axis I have the instrumental magnitude which is related only to the counts detected in the image. And on the x-axis I have the known magnitudes of the stars. So. In principle, if your instrument is fine, the brighter the, the brighter the known magnitude, the brighter should be the instrumental magnitude. There should be a one-to-one -one relation. And that's what we are seeing here. And these red, green, and blue points, these are just magnitudes measured in different apertures so that the magnitudes are slightly brighter if you use a bigger aperture. Oh, okay, right. So 
Um, so there is some there are some funny things going on in the uh, towards the ends of the uh, ends of the two uh, the two, two ends of the plot where typically if you if your source is really bright then it's very likely that your CCD is going into the nonlinear regime. In those cases, you will see that the magnitudes are not quite where you expect them to be, and you don't want to use those stars for photometric calibration. On the faint end, I think it's just a matter of signal to noise, which is if if if, if your um, Source is really faint, then you do not get enough signal to noise on those targets, and then your photometry measurements will not be as accurate. Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. So uh, just note that what I've plotted here is uh, the magnitudes in three different apertures. So this red is five pixel, six pi green is six pixel, uh, blue is seven pixel. And there is a systematic offset between these two, again, because as I said, the larger the aperture, the, the more flux you are collecting, the smaller is the magnitude. Which is why, even though there is a one-to-one -one correlation, the correlation is, has a systematic offset as a function of the pixel size. So the the entire exercise of deriving a zero point is just to measure what is the offset between the instrumental magnitude and the known catalog magnitude, and that's what we'll do in the next step. Where what I'm doing here is effectively for each aperture diameter, I'm up computing a zero point because. For each aperture diameter, you can compute a zero point because, as I said, the, the, you want to measure the flux of your source in the same aperture as that of your science target. So I'm computing this here. So what I did here was I just stored all the results into a Python dictionary where what you're seeing here is the diameter of the aperture, the zero point, and the scatter in the zero point. What is the scatter in the offset between the known uh, between the known panstars magnitude and the instrumental magnitude. Uh, it's more of a con I'm computing a constant offset. I'm not fitting a it should be a constant offset. Yes. Uh, yes. Unless if your slope is not one, then it's not this. Yes. Yes. In the slope should be yes. 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 The slope should be one for a good instrument. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Right, so, okay, so the next step is a bit tricky. I, 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 we were, we had some, we had to struggle a bit to get PyRAF. So PyRAF is, so, um, okay, so IRAF is a general set of tools that is quite useful for doing uh, many things in astronomy, except it's ridiculously difficult to install. Uh, and we had some difficulties in installing it. So um, in principle, so once you have the zero point for each aperture, you want to, Go to your favorite science target, put an aperture on that science target, and measure its flux. And IRAF does have really well laid out routines for doing that, except we don't have that running in this Docker right now. So what we'll do instead is uh, I, I've run it on a, another machine that actually has PyRAF installed. And you should just use the output from IRAF. Just believe me. This, yeah. So you don't have to run these steps. These steps will not this, these steps will not work. In case you have a separate running machine where IRAF works, this might work doesn't work on this docker. Um, so just skip over to the next cell, where if you downloaded the latest data, that lat latest data folder that Igor pointed you to, so there should be a file in that folder. If you go to data photometry plus this extension, this already has the measured magnitude of our science target. So in this case, just so you know, yes, our science target in this case is a is a Cepheid variable. It's called V641 Cygni. You can look up V641 Cygni. It's a Cepheid variable that, as as the name suggests, it's a it's a variable. So its magnitude changes with time. And in the light curve analysis module, you'll actually be using photometry um, to do uh, to, uh, to to actually see what the Cepheid variable does as a function of time. But in this case, you're actually seeing how that photometry was generated. So if you just run this cell, okay. So Try running this cell. If so, oh, okay. So path, yes, the path, yes. Okay, so I wanted to pay attention to the 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 magnitudes that were actually measured for this source. So if your aperture correction worked fine, in the sense that your zero points were consistent with what you would expect for bigger and bigger apertures, it should not matter what your 
aperture really is. You should get the same magnitudes across all apertures. That's the point of the aperture correction. So as you see here, the magnitude are all magnitudes are all consistent with each other within the error bars. So the error is about five percent, less than five percent for most cases. And what you're seeing is that for diameters already ranging all the way from four pixels to about fourteen pixels, you get exactly the same magnitude. Which means that your aperture based zero points were fine. And in this case, so in this case, if you wanted to decide the size of the aperture, you should really select the one that maximizes your signal to noise. But otherwise, there shouldn't be any difference between the apertures that you, uh, sorry, the magnitudes that you measure in different apertures. So we are running a bit short of time. So uh, there is th the rest of the module is actually dealing with PSF photometry. And as you already heard in the lecture, the idea behind PSF photometry is not to measure magnitudes in fixed apertures. Instead, you take a few good stars inside the field and you compute what is the PSF, the point spread function of stars in the field. And once you get, you get a model for what the PSF actually looks like, you fit that PSF to all the sources in the field to derive PSF based magnitudes. These, these are all PSF magnitudes and these are particularly important when you are dealing with crowded fields. Because in this case it's, it's, it is, it is a crowded field but it's not as bad that you wouldn't be able to get uh, aperture photometry from this. But if you are looking at fields like globular clusters for example where you have stars overlapping everywhere. In that case, you want to actually compute a PSF model for the stars in the field and then fit each and every star in the field with that PSF model. And once you fit a PSF model, you can compute what is the total flux inside that PSF and do exactly the same thing. You fit a PSF model, derive fluxes for all of the stars in the field and then derive a PSF based zero point. Once you have that, once you have a PSF based zero point, you can again apply the same correction which is take the PSF based zero point Add the, add the instrumental magnitude which is again me measured from a PSF, uh, me measured from PSF fitting and then apply the same thing you should get exactly the same answers. It should not matter what you are using, aperture photometry and PSF photometry, there's just different ways of doing the same thing but the magnitude should be the same. Unfortunately we do not have time to go into this but the, the solved module will have all the uh, stuff that you need to run. Uh, yeah, so we, in this case we, we were using a uh, code known as PSFX, it's PSFX is, uh, what it does is, is does this PSF computation and fits all of the sources with a PSF and gives you PSF based magnitudes. Uh, but we do not have time for that but if you have any questions please feel, feel free to contact me and you should be able to run this, the solved version of this notebook um, when you are uh, trying to run the ne rest of the uh, thing you know, at your leisure. So. Thank you.